We are so glad that you've joined us, and we hope this message is both encouraging and challenging to you. And we want to invite you to join us for one of our Sunday gatherings. And if you need to know more information about that, you can check us out at cornerstonerockwall.com. Here at Cornerstone, uh, we are teaching upside down righteousness. Uh, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount. If, if you're not tracking with us, it's, it's the greatest sermon ever preached. Not, not my sermon, but Jesus' sermon by the greatest preacher ever preached, uh, Jesus Christ himself. And, and he's sitting on the slopes of the Sea of Galilee, and he's preaching to, to people that are disciples and those, those are, that are curious about Christ and, and becoming a disciple. And, and it's really about, he's teaching about the, the kingdom of God and the nature of that kingdom. And as well, the, what is meant for the kingdom-minded people, right? It's who they are and, and how they are to live, and so today we're in chapter 6 of Matthew. So if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew. And I'm going to tell you kind of the big picture or, or the main thing you need to grab out of this text. Um, it is that uh, motive matters. Our motive of, of righteousness or practicing right things before the Lord is what matters. How we go about doing not religious activity, not the duties of the Lord, but just uh, when we're in pursuit of the Lord, our motives behind it are what matter. Genuinely, all of us are sinful by nature, right? All of us have a desire to, to be acknowledged. We, we want to be recognized. And, and uniquely, as a result of sin, this creeps into every one of our lives. Not, I'm not exempt, right? I get on the stage and I have to deal with emotions, wanting to make it about how well I did or how you perceive me, when in turn, I really need to make it about the Lord, and what he's doing. So it's a battle we all fight in our selfishness. Um, you know, I was never selfish growing up, ever, until I got married. That's a true story. I was never selfish until I got married, and I realized how selfish I was. That's a lie. Uh, I was absolutely be selfish, but getting married allowed me to see how selfish I really was. Uh, for many of us, uh, selfishness is this desire for attention and want to be noticed. Uh, I think we all want to be noticed. In fact, it starts young, right? Kids are like, mommy, mommy, look at me. Your daddy, watch this. It's, it's kind of the way that we're wired. We, we all want that affirmation. And uh, it's, I think it's many reasons that social media has become so big. You realize that for those that have social media, we actually have a page that boasts us individually. I mean, think about it. I got a Facebook page, and that Facebook page is all about Bill Lucas, and his family. It boasts me. And it's not a knock, but in 09, uh, they came out with the like button, which changed society. I think it, is, it has been instrumental in the change that we have in front of us, right? Other than the filters and the algorithms that determine what you see and you don't see, and then the marketing component, it's really become a measurable metric by which we can compare ourselves to others. I think it's, it's been detrimental to our society. In fact, if you look at 2007 and, and the uh, anxiety and depression since then is dramatically grown. In fact, uh, the, the suicide rate for, for children aged 12 to 14 has doubled since then. It's kind of mind-blowing. What happened in 2017? Well, social media came out before that, but smartphones... Right, Steve Jobs and Macworld came out with the first uh, iPhone that was the full non-watered-down version of the internet. It was completely accessible in the hand. So potentially everybody could hold this device in their hand and have access to this, uh, this world that boasts the individual. Here's some unique stats. Um, people check their phones every 4.3 minutes. Youth probably put down their phones every 4.3 minutes. No, I'm kidding. Um, not an actual stack. But I have youth, and, and, and what that has done to them is grab their attention. 70% uh, of people check their Facebook every single day, according to broadband search. An average person spends two and a half hours, two hours, 27 minutes on social media every day in America. Two hours, 27 minutes every day on social media. It's, it's an average, and, and it produces this idea that we have become spectators of other people. Whether we realize it or not, uh, we, it, it, and it also encourages them to become a spectator of us. In fact, 
I find that I have posted things, and it's really about just sharing my life or my family and what is happening. And I get to the point in the midst of that post that I'm looking at it, but I'm only looking at how many likes I got or how many comments I have. Or I get to the point that I, I actually see somebody else and go, man, they had 330 likes? Like, what kind of social group do they have? I just got a measly couple few likes, and I begin to even compare just the number of likes. And I think you probably could relate to this if you're on Facebook and you recognize those likes or Instagram or those platforms that do that. Most people only post their absolute best, right? I don't, I don't see the, the kid got sick and vomited in the car seat and we had to clean it up and the car broke down. I just don't see that on social media. And in fact, I, I feel like it's uh, exhausting to keep up with fake book, really. And I'm on it, but I feel like it's exhausting. Um, the guy who developed the like button, his name is Justin Rosenstein. He has publicly stated that he actually has deleted the app and he gives warnings about the harmful effects, harmful effects and addictive nature. We all want to be noticed, don't we? And if you're not on Facebook or social media, it's, it's not a knock. I actually very much recognize my personal nature in this, right? I mean, even I stand over here and I'm praying and, and I'm really connecting with the Lord as I'm praying, but then I'm, I recognize my body language and then I have this moment of like, oh, I don't want to do this for show, right? It's, it's this thing we will fight all of our lives. Uh, Matthew 6 says, beware of your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Verse 2. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that when your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they stand, they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. I love that there is a warning here. Beware of hypocrisy. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men. The Lord of lords, right, the king of the universe is actually giving a warning. He says, be careful not to practice these things. There are, there are two types of righteous. There is, there is general morality and then there's religious activity. A giving, praying, and fa uh, fasting, right? That word righteousness, we can replace it. Some scholars or some texts that I read would call them almsgiving, but here I, I landed that it. it's really giving, praying, and fasting, these acts of righteousness that he's talking about. And he's saying, don't do them before men, right? Don't do them to be noticed by others. Do them between you and the Lord, and, and some might ask, well, why don't you mention Bible reading or, or daily devotions? And the truth is that thought of daily Bible reading didn't exist more than 250, 300 years ago. That's actually a new thought, right? The common man didn't have the Bible in his own language 300 years ago. It wasn't, wasn't common. It was expensive. Printing presses didn't make that much ground. And then his own language, right? It was often just coming from the top down. Now, do I think that it's essential, daily devotions? Absolutely. Do I think that uh, spending time with the Word, with the Lord and the Word and, and, uh, and the Bible through the years is essential? Absolutely. In fact, I've never met a strong Christian who didn't spend time with the Lord and His Word, memorizing, growing passionately with Him. I'm convinced it comes through this growth with Him. Beware of being righteous with the motives of the praise of man over the acknowledge of men, right? That's, that's the caution. It's this type of righteousness that's being performed to be seen by people, uh, to be seen, right? But it says to be seen by man. Uh, that's the Greek word for which we get theater, right? It's important to recognize that there is this theatrical righteousness that exists. Theatrical righteousness is the concern with dramatically noticeable good. 
It exists, right? It's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees did. They wanted to be dramatically noticed for their good behavior. And, and the truth is the Lord is addressing this. He is saying, don't be the one that says, look at me, look at me. I go to church. I follow Jesus, right? I read my Bible. Don't be that person. It's not who we're supposed to be. That's a fake righteousness. Uh, the problem was that some of the religious days of the uh, religious leaders of the time loved that boast. And I, I look at even Matthew 15 and you see Christ. He says, you hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain, they, they worship me. In vain, they worship me. Right? And, and you even see later that they build these phylacteries that sit on their head. These phylacteries were just a, a leather box that sat there that was to hold the Torah. We can read about this in Deuteronomy 6, or they put it on their arm, and their, their uh, the idea is that it would make them bigger and bigger and bigger to look more important or more, more godly. And we see that that's not what it's about. As you see the word hypocrite in the text, a hypocrite liter literally means the one who wears a mask. Often in Greek plays, you would go to a, a play and there would be one person that would do the whole play with every character, right? That, that actor would come out with a face mask on and he would play this character and display this behavior and then he would go in the back. He would come back and with a different mask and a different behavior and he would play a second character. And then he would leave and then he would come back and he would play a third character, right? The same person, every character was different, but it was based on the mask that you saw. And, uh, and, and the truth is, that no one often knew who the real actor was. You never got to see their face. In fact, a hypocrite, it's, uh, it's often that if they were a hypocrite long enough, they didn't even know who they really were, right? They were deceived and confused because they lived these uh, different behaviors. A hypocrite has multiple lives. For example, a hypocrite would act differently at church than they do with their friends, right? They don't have the same behavior amongst them. Or, or maybe their friends, they don't really want their family to see their friends. Um, or their church group, right? They have co-workers, and then they're in public, and they don't want their, their community group, if they're with their community group, to recognize, uh, oh, there's my co-worker, because they live this separate lifestyle or behavior in these different places. Well, the opposite of, of hypocrisy is integrity. Uh, to live an integral life is is this idea that you're the same person regardless of what people group you're, you're around, right? You are the same person on Sunday as you are on Monday through Friday, right? You're the same person uh, around your parents that you are with your friends. And if that's you, then you live a life of integrity. In fact, I would even go one step farther and say a life of integrity is someone that, that is the same person when no one's watching them. It's the heart that says, this is who I am and I don't pretend to be somebody else. Verse 2, it says, thus when you give, notice it does not say that you have to be a varsity Christian to give, right? Uh, when, you, when you're a JV Christian, you give, give like this. It clearly implies that believers are generous in nature, right? That they give. Um, and then it talks about receiving a reward. That, that idea of receiving a reward is paid in full. It's complete. Jesus talks quite a bit about stewarding resources throughout Scripture. In fact, a lot of the parables uh, is this idea of money, possessions, property. And I think it's unique that as we hit this text, that it is this reminder for all of us. And, and I'm just going to pause and just be honest. Like, I've been a, a believer for almost 30 years. My generosity has only become a reality for me in the last kind of four years. Right? And it's out of this reminder of text that Scripture calls me to be. And, and I was ashamed of that because I knew that there was this truth of who I was supposed to be. And I didn't, I didn't live based on what I saw. And then you also see in the text that they're sounding trumpets, right? Jesus is saying um, that they wanted the attention. It was about me. And, and I, I read in some of these uh, uh, commentaries that scholars, some say that they actually blew a trumpet. So you have a a uh, Pharisee that was going to give money, he was going to tithe, and he actually blew a trumpet so that people could look and say, look at me, 
right? And I think that's not the case. I think what I read also was, in general, uh, these, these tithes containers were some sort of a funnel. And when they walked up and they dropped their money in, right, they didn't have dollar bills in this era. They, they actually just had coins. And they would drop their coins in. And uh, the Pharisees loved to walk up and just drop it with a sense of loud noise. And that loud noise would make people look like, hey, he's dropping money into it, right? It was still about the attention. It was still about, look at me. I, I, I think of GoFundMe. Now, I'm not being critical of the receiving end of a GoFundMe. But on the giving end of a GoFundMe, you ever look, you ever see a GoFundMe? If you're not sure what a GoFundMe is, it's that people have real needs. And, and I think these people have had their needs met through generous people. But, but I, I've seen these and I've even participated in them and I could see the list of who's given and how much they've given. And I think, man, that's, it's surprising that it's become this world of who's given and how much. And maybe the design is that it would motivate some to give more because they saw someone else, right? You can also give anonymously. I recognize that people may not even know that you can give anonymously. Today in our culture, there are, there are actually YouTubers that make money from their views. And, and they'll go up to a homeless person. And there are many different scenarios. But they'll, they'll go up to a person and they'll say, for example, a homeless person, he's got a piece of pizza or two pieces of pizza, and he says, could I have some? And he says, yeah, absolutely. And, and the guy sits down with him and said, why would you share with me? He's like, well, I have. So, And then he hands him $500. And, and the fact that he's handed money, it really ascribes to more people liking it, which in turn earns him more money, which in turn he gives more money. And we've built this culture about look at me while I give, Right? And, and so this is what, what Jesus is addressing in the text. And I would say for me, the only caveat is when we're generous or when we pray or when we're fasting, the design is that it would be very private. It would not be for the people to see. But for me, the area that I feel like, man, this is an area that I'm okay with it being public is if it teaches. But remember, motive matters. What matters is the motive behind what you're doing. And so, for example, if, if I've got a heart to tithe and I never display that in front of my kids, what are they going to get out of it? They never see me live some of these spiritual disciplines, right? Some things are taught and some things are caught. And I think that that's the, the okay is if it teaches. Verse 13, it says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Uniquely, 90% of the population is right-handed. I don't know that it's relevant. But it's kind of this idea that when I give, I need to forget about it. When I give, I need to drop it in. I give X amount of dollars or I, I help somebody and I don't hold on to this memory of like, oh, remember when I gave? Because that builds this kind of self-confidence. It builds this pride. Like even pure motives, the enemy wants to drive into our heart and make it about us. So it's that I give and I walk away and I, I, don't, fight the, I don't buy into the temptation of feeling good about something. And it's interesting that uh, uh, giving invites God into our finances. Kind of a crazy thought that, that in 24 years of ministry, I've never met someone that at some point in their life didn't want God to be a part of their finances. Now, it's usually when I've got consumer debt or I've got some medical bills or I have some tragedy that there's an invite to allow God to be a part of the finances. But when we make that decision, invite God... When we make that decision to be generous by nature, it invites God into our finances. I love that God is gracious, that he's not holding it against us. And, and it's in those times that we get to see the response, right? And then it talks about the reward. He will reward you in secret, right? This idea, of you'll receive a reward. What is the reward? I actually think that the reward is being generous, Right? When you, when you know there's a need and you meet a need, the reward is actually being faithful with that need. And, and the only way I could explain this, like I remember when I first became a believer or before I became a believer, like there was some knowledge of God and, and I saw some of these people and the way they lived and I liked some of the way that they lived, but there was another part of me that I was like, uh, I'm, I, I'm not there. Like I don't want to quit living my life. And then there was maybe a bait and switch or call it what you want, but I went to an all-night event just to meet some girls. 
I was 18 at the time. I wasn't married. And, and at this all-night event, I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I heard this truth, and I surrendered my life to it. And uniquely, the next day, the reason I wasn't making a decision for the Lord no longer mattered. It, didn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't even value in the decision. For me, the greatest thing I could do is follow, and then the response is he took care of everything else. And I love that. It's, it's the confidence of honoring the Lord. That's our reward. And then he says, give to the needy. Motive matters, right? And, and there are a couple of things to process. Who are the needy? Who are the needy? Is it the homeless person that you see walking down the road? You realize that, that there's an estimated between 730 and 740 million people that live on $1.90 a day? It's a mind-blowing number. Now, I'm not, I'm not discerning who the needy are, and my heart is not to, to in, expect or to push a thought there, but I would say if, if you're going to give, it's essential that you seek the Lord. Right? My former role in, in a church, I was a pastor, we predominantly worked with homeless people. That school district had 300 homeless families. So there was, there was homeless families everywhere, and we actually fed them five nights a week, and we had a resource center, and it was connected to the local church. And, and at that place, we learned, and so here's why I would say, seek the Holy Spirit. And also know that you and I, we have dignity from our efforts. We have dignity from our work. When you work at something, it gives you a sense of dignity. Typically, a homeless person that doesn't earn money doesn't have that sense of dignity. Typically, when you hand them money, you're reinforcing they don't have dignity, right? It, it just reinforces that they didn't earn it, and it, it builds into that cycle. And so my encouragement is to seek the Lord. And my other thought is this. If you're going to err, don't err on not giving. Actually, err on giving. Err on the right thing to do that does honor the Lord. Our job is to live by faith. There were a couple times in my life that I told my wife, and where I came from, a lot of homeless people, I'm like, we're not giving to homeless people anymore. And then I give, and she's like, you told me we're not doing that anymore. I'm like, you got to follow the Lord on this, right? Um, and, and, and then there are times that I'm like, no, and then I, I go with a friend, and he's bringing ice to a homeless community, and I, I'm wrestling. And, you know, you know, Rockwell, you don't see a lot of homeless community, but you go to Dallas, you see them. And so what do you do with it? Yeah, and you pray, you seek the Lord, you make sure. The other thing I'm going to encourage you to do is I'm going to encourage you to be engaged in giving the most precious commodity we have. What is that? Time. That's right. Give time. Give time because often that's going to reinforce dignity. Often that time is you identifying skills that they might have or, or where you can encourage them or connect them to a resource that's greater than a one-time gift that will help them in this situation. You know, uh, I, I am going to just say this. Uh, you pray, you seek the Lord, you err on giving, and then this other question is, what do we do with the needs around the world? And, and I do think it's important for you to know that when you give to Cornerstone, you're actually giving through Cornerstone to missionaries that are reaching the lost and building the church around the world, right? It's, it's this idea that when you are generous, uh, you, are, you are being used by the Lord, right? I think... It's the reason that we have Paul um, from the Kairos prison ministry up front to share about an opportunity where these prisoners can have a meal and hear the gospel and be loved on. And you get to watch a video like you did last week where this full-on gang member gives his life to the Lord. Complete transformation. So uh, if, if you didn't know, he'll be in the lobby. You can find him today on a, on a side note. But it's the reason that at Cornerstone you're going to hear about Sailor Creek because there's a ministry that has a heart to reach and love and disciple women for the gospel, right? Uh, James Tara with Light Africa Ministries. Uh, it's the reason he comes up here, and, and there are opportunities for you to support children in Africa, right, where, where a mom or dad may not exist, and if they do, they're probably living on $1.90 a day. And as they go to school because they have support, they're being reached with the gospel and they're being discipled, right? This is in response to... Uh, us being a faithful people going, Lord, we just want to honor you with this. Motive matters. I'm going to say this. When I, was, when I was dating my wife, and some of you might have heard this story, but uh, 
But I remember we were just eating and the time of the tithe plate was coming around. We were in Sunday, we were in church, and I was wrestling back when you used to write checks. And I'm thinking, I'm going to write a check, and I'm leaning where she could see it. You know, it's kind of this idea, but I'm wrestling. How much do I write it for? And she's sitting next to me, and so I finally fill it out. I know what I got in my bank, and it's really about this. And then it's coming, and I'm wrestling, thinking of all the things that I could do with this check. And she leans over and says, if you can't do it with a joyful heart, just don't do it. I'm like, oh, oh, man, that one hurts. But what it told me is where she was, right? And it told me where I was because it wasn't my heart. It was, for me, it was about the show. Now, as we jump into the rest of the tech, text about prayer, um, I think we've got a lot of thoughts around prayer. And it's easy to have, like, is it this? Is it that? Do I receive? Do I only pray if I need something? Do I have a relationship with the Lord? I'm going to read verse 5 through 8 again. It says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, I'm going to pause there. Just notice that's the second time he says, when you pray. Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And when the father sees you in secret, he will reward you. The third time it said, and when you pray, verse 7, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows that you need them before you ask. Three times he says when you pray. Chapter 6, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. Next week, Dustin is addressing the fasting, right? It's this idea of, of these spiritual truths, these spiritual disciplines. There's an expectation that we would do these things. The Jewish people were expected to pray three times a day. It just was the culture, right? They, nine, 12, and three. It was common. And in fact, it was common that they would be doing what they normally did. And when that time came, they would stop and they would just pray. But look, that's not the problem that the Lord is addressing. They're not just stopping where they're at, which might be a smaller side street or, or somewhere there it's not visible. They're actually going to the street corners and the synagogues to intentionally at those times to be praying. It's actually this, once again, look at me. Look how important I am. I'm going to look holy. I'm going to look righteousness, right? And so even though it wasn't common, it's this idea that they were putting on their best. In fact, Pharisees made sure that they enunciated and articulated every single syllable very clearly because it was looked as being righteous. And, and then there was those that prayed longer than others. They would pray these long prayers, and in praying these long prayers, it seemed like these people must be more righteousness. But unfortunately, it was a false righteousness because it was about that acknowledgement. Now, I know some of you are long-praying people. You pray long. Uh, in my community group, when we have a meal every week, I have to choose who prays. Because if the wrong person prays, I'm thinking, I just want to eat. <laughs> but, but long prayers aren't wrong, right? As long as they're done with the pure motives. Pure motives. And I'm also going to say this. Public prayers aren't wrong as long as they're done with the right motives, right? There is a place. We pray together a couple times this morning. Our heart is that we would honor the Lord. It's about our motives. Verse 5, Jesus wants us to realize that it's not a demonstration of righteousness or self-righteousness but it's an exercise of righteousness. Now, there's a difference. It's not a demonstration. It's, a, it's an exercise. My daughter, when she was younger, she would do Irish dancing, and she was really good. I mean, she was very talented at Irish dancing. And, and she would often, um, you know, go learn something, and then I would hear her tapping upstairs, like bouncing up there, and then she'd run through the house pogoing on her toes and twirling. And, and for her, that was the exercise. That was the, the practice. This was the thing she did. She didn't do it for display. She did it because she wanted to grow in it. But then she would have these, I don't know if they called them fashions. I could have asked her, but they would have these competitions. And she would get up on the stage and she would, she would do her little routine. And then she would bow and she would get off and it would get rated. And, and see, for for her and for us, that type of behavior is the demonstration, demonstrating what her work was. She was demonstrating what she had accomplished. The purpose behind the moment was to show that she had put the effort in, right? 
So I think it's important to recognize that God doesn't want our demonstration. He wants our exercise. He wants our practice. Whether we realize it or not, all three of these disciplines are about practice. They're about exercise. But practice and exercise isn't something that, uh, that comes easy. We actually have to make a decision to put the time in. I don't know how these ex exercises are for you, but for me, I have to be conscious, conscious about them. Think about prayer, like specifically prayer. I have to make a decision that says, I'm going to put the time in with the Lord, right? Not when I need him. Not, not when there's something in front of me that I need a result. I've got to go create committed, devoted time to hang out with the Lord. And I think it's going to look different for each one of us. And if we don't set the discipline, it's not going to happen. Prayer is not a demonstration of faith. It's an exercise of faith. Um, notice uh, that when Jesus focused on these words, uh, we use how many words, right? It's not about how many words we use. If you look at verse 7, he says, For they think that they will be heard for the many words. Jesus isn't focused on how many words we used. It's not about how many, how eloquent. It's just simply the heart. No different than uh, my daughter, an Irish dancer. She exercised her strength and ability. The more she exercised, the stronger she got, right? For the Lord, I think when it comes to prayer, it's not about lofty. It's not about more. Prayer is about a relationship where we find our identity with the Lord. It isn't a performance. I love that God is welcoming us on the basis of grace. He welcomes you and I on the basis of grace. And it, it literally has nothing to do with our prayer. You notice that Father's mentioned here a couple times? When you think about Father, what comes to your mind? A.W. Tozer says that uh, what comes to your mind, what comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. When you think about God as our Father, what do you think about? For some, it's this cosmic being or light force, right? I'm guessing that that's not here. For others, he's a grandpa with glasses, he's old, he's frail. Might have candy in his pocket, um, sweet old guy. For others, he's tracking every issue so that one day he can execute those things in your life. For some, it's like the Google God, right? How many of you have a Google Home Hub, right? Hey, Google. Hey, Google. Right? Some of you, that's the God that you have. It's important to know that God is uh, taught as a father in the New Testament almost 200 times is a father figure to us. Now, my relationship with my father was fractured. My dad left when I was nine. I chased him all of my life. There are times that I would drive to a men's retreat and he would be, uh, that was six hours away on a lake, but he would live up in that area. And this is a few years in a row and we'd make plans to meet. And then I'd, since we had no reception on these houseboats, I'd get a ride on a, a boat across the lake and I'd get to the shore. And when I got there, I would, I would call him because now I had reception, and he would say, oh, Judy needed a, a nap. And so here I didn't see him for a year or two, and Judy needed a nap, which is, you know, his wife. So the thing that drew him out was alcohol and a woman that wasn't my mom. And as a result of that, a young boy at age nine, until I was 44, I wanted a dad in my life. Uniquely, I wanted a dad. I would tell him these things sometimes, and he would apologize, and he would cry. And he would say, Dad, I'm so sorry, Billy. And nothing would change. And I think I'm not the only one that experienced that kind of relationship from him. And then at age 44, my sister called me and said, Dad passed. And the reason I was sad is because I knew I would never have a relationship with my father. But the incredible part about that, it has only enhanced my relationship with the Lord. To understand the gravity of my Father in heaven and how he adores me, right? He'll never let me down. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. He'll only speak truth to me. He, he will only lead me in the direction that is best for me when I'm in pursuit of him. That is mind-blowing that he cares to that extent. 
If you have a broken relationship with your father, it shouldn't dictate your relationship with your heavenly father, right? If, if your relationship is subpar what, in what you experience here, know that it could be incredibly better with our heavenly father. In fact, I would say it's the most incredible relationship I have today. He's replaced something that no man could give me, which is a gift. Genesis, I'm uh, sorry, Ephesians 2.18 says, uh, For through him we both have access to the Spirit, to the Father. So when you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So we are no longer strangers and aliens, but we are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. You guys, we, for those of you that have surrendered to Christ, we are fellow citizens, and our citizenship isn't here. It's in a new heaven and in a new earth with no more sin and no more brokenness, right? We, we have been adopted by this God because of the work of Jesus Christ, right? I think it's so important that that some of you may be in here because you don't know who God is. You're exploring faith. You're trying to figure out who is this God. And you need to know that this God adores you, specifically has a heart for you and me. And that is the reason that Jesus died on a cross, a brutal death, so that you could have life. Right? It says in, in Matthew says that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you'd have life and life to the full. That's the Father that we have. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love for us in this, so that while we were still sinners, Christ died. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him, from the wrath of God. We are being saved from the wrath of God. Literally, there is a wrath to come, a final judgment. And we are saved from that final judgment. If you have surrendered your life to him, if you have believed in him and placed your faith in him, and you begin to emulate some of these things that he teaches in his word, and it's not about what you do, it's about what he's done for us. And it's important that you recognize that. You're saved. We'll no longer face that judgment. Exercise righteousness. Practice prayer, giving, fasting. Again, I mention it because it's the text, but I know Justin, Justin's going to do a great job and help us to see it along with the Lord's Prayer next week. The conclusion, motive matters. How you handle your righteousness, whether it's to be seen by man or to be seen by God. Right? We, we don't need affirmation of man, whether it's one, five, or a room of people. We don't need that affirmation. You'll fight it. The enemy is real. The prince of this world exists. We don't need it. We need affirmation of God, and we'll be, we will be rewarded. If it's about man, it is sin. If prayer is about how you are perceived or what you say, it's sin. I would encourage you to repent. I would encourage you to turn from that. Don't make it about people. Even sometimes not praying because you're worried about how you're going to be perceived might be sin. Handle it. Honor the Lord. Confess it. You're not impressing God, so stop trying to. Simply give. Be generous because God is generous. Guys, I'm not even talking about here. Just be faithful. That is my prayer for you. That in this idea of prayer and generosity, you would live that out. You would enjoy what God has to offer you in this. If you're struggling to be generous, confess it. Ask him for help. And then pray. Cry out to him. Make him the focus of your prayer. Make it about him. He is a good, good father who is in full control. He knows what you need. He knows every desire that you have. Do business with him. As, as these guys lead us, I would love for you to just Take 30 seconds and evaluate. Where do you need to work on this? And just do business with the Lord. Literally, he knows what you need. He knows your heart. So before they lead us, just take a few seconds and then I'm going to pray.
God, I, I recognize that as we discuss this uh, idea of righteousness before you, the most important thing is that people respond to you, that they fall more in love with you, that they want to honor you, that they seek you in prayer, right? That they, they by nature are generous because you are generous. And so, Lord, would you help us to be a people that's not selfish, that's not wanting affirmation, that's not wanting this for us, but that want your kingdom come, that we want what you want. We need you. Pray this in Jesus' name.